next on Unsolved Mysteries. Elvis Presley's sudden death shocked and saddened the world. Is it possible that the king of rock and roll took his own life? Many eyewitnesses claim they saw a fiery object fall from the sky and crash in the woods near Kecksburg, Pennsylvania. Why does the government say it never happened? When a wealthy casino owner turns up dead, his girlfriend and business partner become the prime suspects. And an ordinary trip to the corner store ends up in death for the son of a prominent television actor. Our team is standing by. Maybe you can help solve one of our cases. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Join us. Elvis Presley has been called the world's greatest entertainer. But on August 16, 1977, his life came to a shocking end. At first, it was said he died of a heart attack. Later reports blamed a massive drug overdose. But Presley's own stepbrother is convinced that the king's death was not accidental. He says that Elvis Presley committed suicide. Elvis Presley woke up on the 16th of August, premeditated, planned, took and killed himself deliberately. Most people absolutely refuse to believe that Elvis Presley would kill himself. However, David Stanley's eyewitness account, along with the physical evidence, makes for a compelling case. And now, both sides of this ongoing controversy. Memphis, Tennessee. Drugs were part of Elvis's daily routine. Three times a day on a strict schedule, nearly a dozen different prescription drugs were administered to him by members of his entourage. These drugs included Secanol and Demerol. Insiders say that this dangerous cycle of drug use began in 1958 when Elvis was drafted into the army and sent overseas. I went to Germany with him after I got out of the Marine Corps. Red West was one of his closest friends. He was on guard duty on the Russian front, and if you went to sleep and got caught asleep, you're in trouble. So this sergeant said, take these little things here, they'll keep you up. And wow, man, it started feeling good, and uh, that's how it began. After the Army, Elvis returned to his life as an entertainer. Elvis's greatest desire was to be a serious dramatic actor, and this was denied him because his management felt that they wouldn't make as much money if they put him in a dramatic role. They wanted him to be in the formula. So this depressed him a great deal. Elvis was frustrated by lightweight movie roles and was overwhelmed by the endless demands of his fans. He retreated into a shadow world behind the gates of his Memphis mansion Graceland. Elvis sort of put himself into a cocoon, and Graceland more or less became a tomb for him, or a cave to go hide from life. The windows were sealed, the outside did not enter in. So his day-to-day -to -day touch with reality had really been removed. People say, what do you think the most difficult part of Elvis Presley's life was? Being Elvis Presley, looking out a window, seeing 10,000 people who think you can walk on water walking out on a stage and seeing 22,000 flashbulbs going off, thinking you are a king. The combination of high times on tour and isolation at home took its toll on Elvis. His absences, affairs, and drug use led to the end of his stormy six-year marriage to Priscilla. He would get himself in a rage over that. He would get himself so worked up over it that uh, he'd begin to take the medications to deal with the depression of the rage. And then suddenly some shows are starting to be canceled. 
Insiders say that by the mid-70s, Elvis was so dependent on drugs that he required supervision 24-7. David Stanley and a group of men known as the Lifers gave him anything he wanted. We were the ones who were with Elvis all the time. Elvis needs something to eat. Elvis needs to be woken up at a certain time. Uh, Elvis needs his medication. Elvis demanded that every day he receive three separate doses of drugs that he called attacks. Each attack contained a dangerous combination of pills or shots of Valium, Nebutal, Demerol, Quaalude, and Secanol. The first attack was usually given between 2 and 3 a.m. After he had taken his attack, uh, with attack one, he would have a, a couple of cheeseburgers, uh, potatoes. The attack one effect would get him groggy and sleepy. We would have to watch Elvis, because sometimes he'd be eating and just fall asleep with his food in his mouth, oftentimes choking on his own, on, on his own food. After sleeping for a few hours, Elvis would receive attack number two. That would last for several hours, and now you're in the morning hours. You know, you're looking at 10 or 11. Then it'd be attack three which was the same contents of attack one and two. I mean, so you're talking, by the time you got done, let's just call it 11 sleeping pills per attack. That's 33. Let's call it three shots of Demerol per. That's nine shots. And some people would say, well, golly, that's, that's, that's six months worth. That was a nightly dose. I talked to him about drugs. And I said, you don't need this stuff. He said, no, -uh. you're wrong. I do need it. And that's, that's when I threw my hand up and said, I've done all I can do. And I was gone shortly thereafter. David Stanley says that he too tried to save Elvis from himself. But the king didn't welcome his advice. Now, I knew Elvis wouldn't have shot me. But I knew right then, we have got a serious, serious drug problem here. Elvis became more and more depressed in the weeks before his death. Despite the millions he'd made, Elvis was short of money. He was overweight and in poor health and dreading his next tour. And in a final humiliation, rock and roll's greatest sex symbol was now reportedly impotent. But perhaps Elvis was most upset about a book some former employees were about to publish just before his next tour. This would be the first time that the fans saw him overweight, not looking good, with the knowledge of what the book contained. And it was, oh my God, they'll, they'll know. And he knew the whistle had been blown on his clean image, and he was terrified. You can see the God, I don't know if it's worth going on mentality. Kind of dreading the tour one day, I don't want to go on a tour. They're going to think this, they're going to think that. He was just really confused. David, come on. Last time I saw Elvis, he said goodbye to me. He was crying. I love you. Uh, he hugged me. I'll never, ever see you again. The next time you see me, it'll be in a higher place in a different plane. The day Elvis Presley died was different than most. He ignored his usual late night feast. He was given his three attack envelopes, nearly three dozen pills, and nine syringes full of drugs at their usual times, but Elvis left them untouched. Ginger Alden, Presley's girlfriend, was the last person to see him alive. All right, Ginger, don't go read. According to reports, around 9.30 a.m., Elvis got out of bed and went to the bathroom to read. And a few hours later, that's where they found his body. Paramedics were already there by the time David Stanley arrived. I looked and saw Elvis in the fetal position and knew he was gone. First thing I said is, you son of a bitch. I knew right there and then at that time that Elvis said, I am out of here. David says that he found all three attack envelopes and several Demerol syringes nearly empty. He believes that Elvis took all three attacks at once purposely to end his life. The official autopsy found that Elvis died of an irregular heartbeat due to severe cardiovascular disease. I don't think there's any evidence that there was a tremendous amount of 
drug abuse or anything misuse. I Dr. Kevin Merigian has studied the official coroner's toxicology report. I know there's been a lot of theories and there's been a lot of conjecture. There's always a debate. Uh, that kind of adds to the mystique of, of Elvis, but he didn't die of an overdose. He, he died of some event, probably cardiac in origin. I'm telling you what I know, and the fact is that much medication will kill you, and Elvis knew that. I know him like a book. I know he's religious, and I know what he would do and what he wouldn't do. And he would not kill himself purposely. Exactly how did Elvis Presley die? This controversy may one day be settled. Elvis's father, Vernon Presley, reportedly commissioned a private autopsy after the official report was completed. Exactly what those doctors found is still unknown. At Vernon Presley's request, the results will remain sealed until the year 2027. Next, what was the fiery object that fell from the sky near Kecksburg, Pennsylvania? And why does the government deny they even found it? December 1965. A brilliant light streaked through the sky over Canada. And it was also seen over the northeastern United States. Thousands of eyewitnesses reported seeing its trail, which was visible for hundreds of miles in every direction. In Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, 40 miles southeast of Pittsburgh, Rob Landy and his brother Ray were outside riding their bikes. We were riding up the road and we just happened to look up into the sky and we saw this thing coming over the tops of the trees. It just glided right across the sky, like across the horizon of the trees. It scared us. We were just like in awe, you know, as we watched it. And then it disappeared and we ran. You knew what an airplane looked like. You knew what a helicopter looked like. And that didn't look like anything we had ever seen before. And the angle that it was that was coming in, I mean, you you knew that it was it, it had to hit the ground. Three miles away, another local boy, Randy Overly, also saw the object. I was playing by a creek at the time and heard a deep hissing noise. And I looked up in the sky and saw an object coming at me from a pretty good distance away. It flew right over top of me no higher in the air than 200 feet and was going no faster than a small airplane would go. Nevin and Nadine Kalp were also playing outside when the object flew overhead and crashed in a wooded ravine half a mile away. This ball of like fire come through. It was something I've, I've never seen before and never seen it since seen the smoke then at that time, down in the hollow there. That ravine may have been the end of the object's journey, but for the residents of Kecksburg, the mystery had just begun. So, what did fall from the sky that December evening? Well, for the first time, eyewitnesses have agreed to tell the story of a night they will never forget. The kelp farm is located less than a mile from Kecksburg Village. The ravine runs east to west for 800 yards, cutting across several farms. The object appeared to have crashed here, more than a half a mile from the kelp's home. Within minutes, Pennsylvania State Troopers descended on the kelp farm. It went down over there. By now, there was no smoke and the light was fading. Search teams were called in to locate the actual crash site. Just keep going straight. You get to that road, make a right. Later, volunteer fireman Jim Mays located the site from an overlook above the ravine. But it didn't look like a plane crash to him. We went up this road and came to the brow of a hill and stopped and down to the right in the hollow were these blue flashing lights. See that light? What is that? 
it uh, wasn't searchers down in the woods with flashlights or anything. It was a, a real bright blue, real bright, like an electric welder. The, uh, the flashes seemed to be timed at what intervals, I don't know. At that point, the troopers decided to close the area off, close the roads off. So he brought the two of us that was with him back to the fire station. A call went out to all the local fire departments and more than 30 volunteer firemen were dispatched from the Kecksburg station. James Romanski was with the search team that actually found the crash site. What is that? I don't know. Here was this humongous metal object, half buried in the ground, about six, seven, eight foot around, and it was every bit of eight, 10, 12 foot long. And to me, the object looked exactly like a fresh acorn that you pick off of a tree. There was no wings, there was no motors, there was no propellers. There was no identification whatsoever that were identified as a aircraft that I would know. There was a bumper on the bottom part of it. On that bumper, there was what I call, it looked to me like the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. It was markings like stars and shapes and figures and circles and lines. Now what it was, I don't know. To this day, I've never seen anything like it. So we're all standing around this thing, wondering what in the heck it could be. And finally, here come two men down through the woods. Gentlemen, you must leave the area. The site is quarantined. You're taking and they took one look at the object and immediately told us to leave. We are in charge. We're taking command. Get out of here. So we left there. And by the time we got back down here to the fire hall, I mean, this place was wall-to-wall -wall military. An hour later, military authorities took over a farmhouse near the ravine owned by Lillian Hayes. Ten, hut! Folks are here. Well, the military was coming in and out of my house all evening. They were making a lot of phone calls and they were standing around in groups talking. Oh, that's a Roger. We believe we've located the ravine. I have no idea who, who they telephoned. There was no calls turned up on my bill. So if I NASA put them on standby. The village of Kecksburg had been invaded, first from the sky, then by the United States military. Next, you will hear several eyewitness accounts of what went into the ravine and what came out. A ravine near Kecksburg, Pennsylvania. A mysterious object fell from the sky and the military immediately closed off the area. They began a top secret recovery operation. 19-year-old Bill Weaver was one of the many curious spectators who tried to catch a glimpse. Hey, what's going on down there? I looked down in there myself. I seen there was a, something down in there that had bright lights on it, but I couldn't see the object itself. Uh, sometime later, I seen a van-type truck pull up there. There were some men dressed in moon suits, we called them at the time, and they had a light-colored box, roughly five foot square, they carried it down into the ravine. The box seemed too small to hold the object itself. Maybe there was something inside the object that the military wanted to remove. Hey, what's going on down there? You'll have to leave the area now. They told me unless I moved my car and got out of there that they would confiscate my car. Back at the Kecksburg Fire Station, Jim Romanski and the other volunteers waited for orders. We looked up and here comes this Jeep down over the hill with its red light on. And right behind the Jeep was a large flatbed truck. And on the back of the flatbed was this covered object. 
And out down the road they went, and where they went, I have no idea. Whatever came down in Kecksburg that night is of high importance to the military agencies. The most mysterious thing about the whole case is the fact that after 25 years, the government still refuses to give us any actual information on what occurred. Stan Gordon interviewed dozens of Kecksburg eyewitnesses and has examined several theories. Astronomers who looked into the case at the time basically felt that the object in question was a bolide, which was a very bright fireball-type meteor. But we now know that thing basically was coming down from the tip of Ontario and appeared to have made about a 25-degree turn toward the east near Cleveland, Ohio. And the interesting thing is now that the new data suggests that the object made a turn towards the south. And then the object made another turn towards the village of Kecksburg, where it was proceeding into there towards the northeast. Within several miles of the crash site, multiple witnesses tell us that this object was coming in at a very, very slow speed of descent. Meteors do not make controlled turns. They do not come in at a slow speed like this. And uh, they, in fact, do not glide in which this thing apparently did. My personal opinion of what landed in Kecksburg that night was a, a, a capsule of some kind uh, from where, whether it was one of ours or a foreign, I have no idea. Two, one, zero. Another theory is that the object was space debris. The government has always monitored not only U.S. space activity, but also launches from other countries. Going back into the records we have from NASA and documents we have from other agencies, they apparently have no loggings for any type of space debris on that date and the time of this observation. So we also have to look to the other possibility. Could this indeed have been in an extraterrestrial spacecraft? This is a copy of the official Air Force record of the Kecksburg incident. Stan Gordon obtained it through the Freedom of Information Act. The report indicated that there was quite a lot of interest by government agencies as to what the object may have been. There were memos there and requests for information from Houston Space Center, from NORAD, from the Air Force Command Post, the Pentagon, even the chairman of the Office of Emergency Planning requested information. The official Air Force explanation was that it was likely a meteor. Basically, what it goes on to say is the fact that the search was called off around 2 a.m. and that nothing was found. But evidence indicates that something indeed was found at the site. The military's idea of finding nothing is completely false. There was something down in that ravine that night. There was something that glowed an awful bright light. And they took something out of there that night. Many eyewitnesses reported seeing a military convoy coming out of the ravine. At the end of the convoy was a flatbed truck with a large covered object on the back. John Hayes was only 10 years old when the truck rumbled by his bedroom window. What was on the back of it, I have no idea. It was about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle from the distance I was at. Gentlemen, you must leave the area. The site is quarantined. According to Stan Gordon, eyewitnesses identified the military unit as the Air Force's 662nd radar squadron based in Pittsburgh. Gordon believes the unit was part of a top secret operation investigating UFOs. There is no entry at all for December 9th of 1965 in the December log of all activities for that squadron. That tells us that somebody apparently wanted to keep all information associated with the unit's involvement in that site away from public information we can see the fact that the government has not told us everything they know about the Kecksburg case. The official reports that the military and the government put out, as far as I'm concerned, are a bunch of bull. If this thing was a meteorite, then why didn't they just bring it out and say, here it is, let the reporters take pictures of it, let the firemen see it, let the people in this area see it. Why the big mystery? Either one, we're dealing with some highly advanced space probe, probably of a foreign nation, that appears to be very highly technical for what we knew about 1965. Or the possibility exists that we may indeed be dealing with an extraterrestrial spacecraft. Next, 
In Las Vegas, a multimillionaire turns up dead. Was it an overdose or a case of murder? We recently told you the story of casino multimillionaire Ted Binion. He was found dead in his mansion by his girlfriend, a former exotic dancer named Sandy Murphy. He's just not breathing, I don't know. At first, his death appeared to be either an accidental drug overdose or suicide. But almost immediately, murder became a strong possibility. The prime suspects? Ted Binion's business partner, Rick Tabish, and Ted's 26-year-old girlfriend, Sandy Murphy, who were rumored to be having an affair. Less than 36 hours after Ted's death, Rick Tabish was arrested as he dug up $4 million in silver that Binion had stashed in the Nevada desert. Tabish was later released on bail. A private investigator hired by the Binion family discovered that Rick Tabish called Sandy Murphy just eight minutes before she dialed 911. And an autopsy found that drugs were not the cause of Ted Binion's death. Based upon my experience and based upon uh, the interviews I've conducted, I personally believe that Ted Binion's death was a homicide. Several months later, Sandy Murphy was arrested. Both she and Rick Tabish were tried for the murder of Ted Binion. The prosecution presented incriminating statements made by both Tabish and Murphy in the weeks leading up to the murder. Medical testimony stated that Binion was actually suffocated. In my experience, um, the amount of drug that, uh, that Mr. Binion had in his system could cause death, but the great majority of people who had that amount would not die. The most damning evidence was a videotape of Sandy Murphy taken the day after Ted Binion's death. This is my personal property. Okay. It was a gift. But I'll leave it so that Jimmy doesn't throw a tantrum. And she is hardly a grieving widow in this videotape. She is narcissistic, possessive, angry, she is unpleasant. We're taking this for a certainty because this is too valuable to leave in the house. No, you're not. Okay, leave it. Just take a video of it. Make sure you count the pieces. There's two pieces here and two pieces here. You see a cold, steely, self-centered woman who is concerned with nothing but her own possessions. The video played a strong uh, role in characterizing for this jury exactly who Sandra Murphy was. Sandy Murphy and Rick Tabish were convicted of murder, burglary, and grand larceny, and were sentenced to life in prison. Update. After an appeal, all the convictions were overturned. At a retrial, both Sandy Murphy and Rick Tabish were convicted only of the robbery charges. Tabish, who was already serving time for unrelated crimes, was given a sentence of up to 10 years in prison. He served his time and has been released. Murphy received the sentence of one to five years, but was released for time already served. Actor Dennis Cole has appeared in dozens of television shows like The Young and the Restless, Fantasy Island, and The Fall Guy. If life was scripted like a Hollywood movie, Dennis's son, Joe, might have followed in his footsteps. But 29-year-old Joe Cole was murdered, and his killer is still unknown. There's not a day that goes by that uh, I don't think about him. You know, I've, we've always shared things. It's like I, I've done a lot of new things, and it's like I have no one to call up and say, hey, hey, Joe, guess what happened here? And he would do the same thing with me. I mean, it's like a part of your heart was just taken and pulled out. Venice, California. This beachfront community is the scene of a year-round street party. For decades, the area has been home to writers and artists and musicians. Joe Cole, an actor and a photographer, fit right in. It was here in Venice that Joe was documenting the lives of homeless Vietnam veterans. 
Cold's longtime friend Henry Rollins, a writer and a lead singer of the Rollins Band, helped with the project. Those men you see talking to themselves, standing next to pay phones on streets, he would bond with these people where they wouldn't give you the time of day, they would tell the story of their lives to Joe. What do you mean? It's a great flick. He shoots down like Rollins and Cole often shopped at an all-night market just the block from their house. On a cool December night, they were returning home, as usual, with their bags of groceries. This is all cabbage, hey, come on. Okay, put, put the back down. Put the back down. Don't look at me, don't look at me. Within one second, you are going from the 90 millionth trip to the grocery store, home, to two guns in your face. Don't look at me! One robber shoved Rollins to his knees. The other forced Joe to the ground. The guy who was on me said, if you yell or if you scream, I'm going to blow your head off. And I said, OK. 40 bucks. This is it? This is all you got? That's yes. all you got? Yes. Get up, get up. Let's get him in the house. What do you have? Go. And at that moment, what I thought was going to happen was we were going to be marched into the house and executed while they robbed the place at their leisure. I heard feet scuffling on the front porch, and then I heard gunshots. And then my legs took off. I did not know the state that Joe was in. I, had, I didn't even hardly remember leaving the house. All of a sudden, I was at a phone, and I called the police and told them what I thought had happened. Pounds, scruffy. The police arrived within minutes, but Joe Cole was already dead. And the killers had vanished into the night. My partner and myself have put in thousands of hours interviewing hundreds and hundreds of people. Criminals always talk, and they talk to other people. Somebody knows something out there that happened uh, to Joe Cole. When someone dies in this way, it's not just the loss of a life. There's a mother, there's a father, you know, and then all of us, the friends, who lost this fantastic person. And you never recover from it all the way. You always carry some of it in you, and it, it wrecks you year after year. The only justice that can be done here is to get those guys or guy off the street so they don't do it to your friend or your sister or your parent or your child. The suspect is 5 feet 11 and weighs 165 pounds. If you have any information about the death of Joe Cole, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, a woman is murdered and a police chief is on the run. A quiet farming town in Nebraska is not the place you'd expect to find a pretty young divorcee to settle. And that's why neighbors were surprised and puzzled when 34-year-old Anna Anton moved in. It turns out that Anna had a little secret. There was no rational reason why she would move here. People don't move to Lyons, Nebraska, unless they have a job or family, or they're returning to a small hometown. And she didn't have any of those. Anna had injured her leg, so she couldn't drive. Her new friends were willing to help out. Good morning. Good morning, Anna. How oh, nice to see you. Nice service. Thank you very much. God bless you. Have Thank a nice you. day now. Anna appeared to be a very religious person. She had very high morals and did not drink. She went to church daily. She could find a ride. Shirley Edgecombe lived across the street from Anna. And as they became friends, Anna began to confide in her. She told me that her ex-husband had been involved in some large drug ring and that she had testified against him and other members of this drug ring. And she was afraid that he was going to harm her. 
She did tell me that she'd chosen that apartment because the police chief lived right above her, and she thought if her ex-husband ever did find her, that he would be leery about bothering her because of the police car parked out in front. One day, when Shirley brought some groceries over to Anna's apartment, she was surprised to find the back door was locked. Anna! She tried again later that evening, but there was still no answer. Anna had disappeared Anna! as mysteriously as she had arrived. I hope you don't mind letting me in. I'm really worried about her. It's not like her to just disappear. Shirley asked for help from police chief Greg Webb, who lived upstairs. We went in thinking we'd probably find Anna had fallen, and there was no sign of her. Here it is. When Shirley found Anna's phone book, oh, Chief Webb offered to call her friends. Maybe one of them had seen her. My job. A few hours later, he called me and said that he had called those numbers in the book, but uh, she wasn't at any of those places. Days later, Anna's body was found in a remote field. She had two 38 caliber bullet wounds in her body. Since the crime scene was outside Lyons' jurisdiction, the Nebraska State Patrol was called in. Upon observing the surroundings around Anna, it was very apparent that uh, she did not succumb her death there, that the body had been moved. How you doing, Mike? Hi. An autopsy later revealed that Anna's blood alcohol level was 0.22, surprisingly high for a woman who supposedly did not drink. The note that Anna gave when Jerry Krieger interviewed Shirley, she told him that Anna seemed afraid of her ex-husband. Within a short period of time, we were able to determine that Anna's ex-husband did have an alibi, and he was not involved in any drug activity. And I just couldn't understand why Anna would fabricate this information. Knowing that Chief Webb lived upstairs, Krieger questioned him about Anna. How long did you know Anna? He learned that they had been intimately involved. Chief Webb was now a suspect. Okay, Rena, let's go over here by the chair and work our way back. Okay. Two days after Anna's body was found, Krieger and lab technicians searched for blood in Anna's apartment. Greg Webb was upstairs in his apartment at the same time. There were times that we would hear somebody walking or moving upstairs. It did sound as though he might have been listening. The police use a special chemical called luminol. It makes drops of blood glow in the dark, even if they have been washed away or are small and faded. We found traces of blood in the living room and dining room area of Anna Anton's apartment. Look at that. Look at that. The trail of blood uh, just outside of Anna Anton's uh, door was quite heavy. The trail then led up the stairs to Greg Webb's apartment. Right here. Right here at the top of the step. OK. My main concern at that particular time was uh, attempting to obtain a search warrant for Greg Webb's apartment. During the police investigation, Greg Webb left his apartment. The next day, he withdrew $3,000 and then disappeared. Five days later, armed with a search warrant, investigator Krieger searched the chief's apartment. We did find a mop that did have a trace of blood that was later shown to be the same type as Anna Anton's. Jerry, you want to take a look at this? In the bedroom closet, the police found a military-style coat with several spots of blood. These stains matched the blood type of Anna Anton. To the lab. Package it and label it. OK. Once I started checking into Anna Anton's background, I had learned that she had two separate lives, one life down here in Lyons, Nebraska where she was very religious. And then the other up in Arnold's Park, where she would refer to as a bar floozy. Hi. Oh, I am. You get better looking every day. Well, thank you. <laughs> this is where Ann Anton and Greg Webb had met. This is Greg Webb. He's chief of police at Lyons, Nebraska. Hi. Greg and Anna became friends. When Anna told him that she was looking for a place to live, Webb suggested that she move into an empty apartment in his building. I think Anna Anton moved here with the anticipation that uh, her and Greg Webb uh, may have something uh, in common and possibly maybe even eventually uh, getting together and maybe even marriage. Anna was infatuated with Webb, but she soon learned that he had another girlfriend. 
Anna seemed to be preoccupied with the fact that Greg had this girlfriend. She talked about laying in bed at night and hearing them upstairs making love, and it bothered her. I believe Anna Anton's death could have resulted from a fight that might have occurred due to the fact that Anna Anton had found out about this other woman and confronted Greg Webb about this. It was learned that during the following day, in the early morning hours, Greg Webb was seen carrying something from his house out to the trunk of his car. And it was learned later that what he was carrying was actually an Anton. The police believe Webb removed all of Anna's clothes and then carefully washed her body before he carried her from the apartment. I feel that Greg Webb might have thought that he had committed the perfect crime the way he had uh, disposed of the body, and also to the fact that uh, he would have known about uh, Anna Anton's ex-husband. A warrant was issued for the arrest of Greg Webb, charging him with first-degree murder. Update. An alert viewer in Orlando, Florida, recognized Webb as a man that he knew as Jim Weber, a construction worker. When I was watching it and they showed Greg, I mean, it looked just like the guy I knew as Jim. And I knew him as Gregory James Weber, and he went by Jim Weber. So uh, I just put the two together. Like I say, it just looked just like him. So it was quite a shock. Florida had faxed me uh, photographs of the driver's license that was issued under Gregory James Weber. And once I did see the photographs, I knew that that was Gregory John Webb. Faced with the charge of first-degree murder, Webb pled to a reduced charge of manslaughter. He was sentenced to seven to 18 years in prison and was released after eight years.